Hey bodies, welcome to Mass Games. My name is Simon and here I am with a guy who has literally changed the industry in my view, at least to a degree, because when I think about, well, I'm going to bring a board game along and when someone says Stronghold Games, I'll show you one example, I won't show you the most famous example, Stronghold Games, down here, little finished game down here, Freedom and Freeze. <laughs> yes, we can talk about obviously bringing over some publishers over to a wider audiences, over to, in fact, well, here we go, I've linked both, I've met Freedom and Freeze, met him in Germany, and now I'm meeting the podfather of gaming because Terraforming Mars has changed the industry and I believe Stephen has got something to say about that. I have a bit of familiarity with some of his uh, work and views and brilliant knowledge and insight about this on some of his other, uh, I guess, interviews and I've been very kind. He's got three this week, so I know I've had him stacked, but I do have some questions. It's great to meet him and um, I just want to catch up. I know it's going to be his dinner time soon. He's going to tell me a bit more about that as well, but firstly, Stephen, how are you? Thank you, Simon, so much for having me on the show. Yeah, you, you, you picked up on a few things. I do have a, do a lot of these, and this is one of three, the first of three that I'm doing this week. Uh, but I, I do love to do these things, and it's my way of just, you know, um, trying to give back to the community, uh, trying to stay in touch with the community, and in any way that I can share knowledge with gamers out there, with content creators, I'm, I'm happy to be able to do that. As long as it doesn't interfere with my meal or my wine time, which is gonna happen in about, you know, like an hour from now. Okay, and what, what wine are you having? Because I have a distinction in wine tasting. I should have brought that on my lapel. Well, well do you, so you have like a, um, a certification of some type? Yes, uh, yeah, distinction, yeah. I, I don't know that, that one, like that certification or, um, but I don't know which one I'm having tonight. I go into my uh, my wine cellar, my wine refrigerator or wine cellar, as the case may be, you might call it. Uh, depending on, we're having a um, meatballs with bulgogi sauce tonight. We're going to be making it. We order like like the ingredients. Like it's from, a, I think it's called HelloFresh. It's a, yeah, we a have service. HelloFresh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really amazing. They send you these things and then you get to cook them. We've got a nice kitchen that we just remodeled. So Excellent. we're going to do that. And uh I mean, usually um, my my general go to are uh, California Cabernet Sauvignons, uh, but for tonight I might be going a little bit like with an Italian Brunello or something like that. It's okay, lots of know, tannins, well, like north, the, north of Italy there. Cabernet yeah, Sauvignon. I like to mix it up. Yeah, healthiest in the world as well, especially from Chile in particular. I had that last weekend, so uh, highly recommend them. And beef, we have we're induction hob now, so that was very good. And Hello Fresh used to be. Gusto, uh, but they, they um, I don't know, they went to an administration and came back. But okay. I, know, I know that's, when I say we're up to these days, my way you've been at Dice Tower West, uh, so I had a few questions about that. Uh, what were you playing sure. there, may I ask? Oh, I my mean, goodness, I, I played a lot of stuff there. They just like, you know, I just were going from table to table. Uh, I'm gonna continue talking up Foundations of Rome. Have you seen this game from, uh, from um, my friends at, Arcane Wonders, my gosh. It just, oh, right. Took me a I do know Arcane Wonders. I'm vaguely mm -hmm. familiar, but the first thing I can think about is um, Foundation of Teotihuacan, which is the latest, I think, Stronghold game. I don't know how, I don't know how associated you are with your, you know, your, your, your podfather strings, literally. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, no, I have no say anymore over there, of course, yeah. but uh, as far as Dice Tower West is, is concerned, Foundations of Rome is this massive production game, uh, produced game, uh, where you're building Rome, but you've got all these 3D buildings that you're actually putting onto oh, wow. a common board that's labeled like A1 to G A1 on one corner to A10, and then down to the J's to J10. So you got this, whatever that comes out, the 10 by 10 yeah. um, uh, board that everybody is gonna be placing buildings on. You buy the lot, in like a not an auction like you know the, the they're out on a, on a, another common board where it's like yep. two dollars if you want to pick the first one it's three coins if you want the next one it's four coins etc so if you really want one that's high up there you got to spend a lot to get it and then later on another turn you can put down buildings you got to create a, a, an economy so you have a commerce buildings you have population buildings so you have this kind of race on the population track where jumping way out is not necessarily a good thing it's, right. it's a very interesting way of scoring points on the population track. And then the big, lots of big points are scored with these civic buildings that only score in, at each era. There's three eras in the game and they okay. score versus the adjacencies that they're with. Like 
versus the number of buildings they're next to or versus the number of population they're next to or commerce, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a phenomenal game. Yeah. It's simple as all, all get go, but the production, when that thing hits the table with your yeah. friends, it's going to be amazing. And I think you can even get non-gamers to play it because when they see this thing, yeah. it's going to be, wow, I want to play this. Um, so simple to play, but with levels of complexity that really, you know, come out as you as you play it again and again. So that's Foundations of Rome. It's going to be fulfilling on Kickstarter within the next month or so. Okay. And it's not going to it's not going into distribution. So got to go over to Arcane Wonders website to actually go purchase a copy. I think that's the only way to get it, at least for now. Okay, I like to do mashups. So it sounds like it could well be something like Adventureland meets Acquire meets uh, Sulkin maybe, meets uh, some kind of other game like that with all those kind of multi-faceted parts to it. <laughs> yeah, it definitely has a choir, definitely has a choir in there where you got to buy the different lots on the on the grid. Yeah. Um, after that, it's, it's simply about managing a, a commerce portion of the game, a population portion, and how you can get these synergies uh, by building within buildings, yep. so to speak. And so really, really interesting. Hmm? How was the duration at various player games? Yeah, it's a one hour game. Yeah, it'll probably be a little bit longer. You shouldn't AP this kind of game because yeah. the turns little, literally take, should Trading be taking you a second. Was the other one I was going to suggest. Cool. So was that the last game you played out of interest? Or what have you played more recently? Um, that, well, that would be one of the last games because I haven't gamed since I got back. It's only been a couple of days since I gotten back. I played um, a, a bunch of Letters of Whitechapel. Oh, yeah. And now I'm going, now I'm going a little... Or, a little uh, older school. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, this is where, where they came out in 2012, 2013. I call like a thing about a Scotland Yard from 1983. But wait, so, do you play as a two or what, what do you prefer to play as a two? Two player? Or yeah. do you prefer Letters well, from Whitechapel as a two or what's your. No, no. I always, I, I, to me, every game is better with more, more players because I'm a huge social gamer and I want to sit around a table with lots of people. So I played Letters of Whitechapel with five and then a couple of times with four. Yep. Worked worked out fantastically in all in all cases, and I had never played this. I love hidden movement games. Yep. I'm a big fan of Fury of Dracula, um, but that's a that's like a three hour extravaganza. And if someone messes play up a game. place, if they forget they went to Munich, oh, it's just it's curtains it, <laughs> after three it, hours. It it, it 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 can really be painful. Um, Whitechapel's streamlined. It's it's sort of like for those who don't know it, it's. Scotland Yard on steroids, right? Yeah. It's got that same idea where, you know, you got to find uh, the criminal. In this case, you got to find Four Jack the Ripper. ladies, yeah, yeah. And there's, you know, there's places where he might have killed someone. Then, then you find out where the murder is. Obviously, he's there at the moment. And then yep. he's got to get back to his hideout. It plays so easily, so streamlined. I loved it. Played it three times uh, in the last two weeks. Okay. And I've... I won once only, but I, every time I play it, I've had a great time. So that was um, that was a biggie. Nice. Uh, and then I played a lot, I played a lot of little you know smaller games. I played Scout. I don't know if you have you even no, heard I don't of know or that played one. Scout yet. Scout is a new one out of uh, out of Japan. In fact, it's either not available yet um, in in other markets or it's just about to be if it, if it's if it's not out yet but it's a it's a ladder climbing game again simple plays 3 to 5 and plays completely differently when you're playing with a three just three-handed yep. versus playing with a full five uh, player account um, I highly recommend it if you're a card player if you're a trick taker or in this I love case it. it's Wizards, actually ladder stuff climbing like that. Yeah. yeah i'm i'm a big big fan of those games so that really speaks to me too uh, check out scout and it's simply a deck of, of special cards uh, that, you know, takes, and, and you, you play three hands or five hands, depending on the number of players, and you're done in like, uh, you know, the whole game is done in like 20 minutes. Fantastic game. Probably brilliant for a game website like Board Game Arena, I imagine, because it's just easy to quickly implement. That would be an easy one for them to do. I don't know what their priorities are these days. It might be mostly Day games these days, but mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely would be point, very yeah. playable, very playable on that kind of site. Yeah. Okay, um, well, I definitely have some ideas on uh, publishing games in the future, but I'll come back to that. So in terms of um, one thing you're known for partially is where Tom Vassell or yourself may be wrong, and I deliberately have not been watching many of these videos at all just to keep this fresh. So we're not talking about you or him, but what do you think is the most overrated? And then after that, I'll ask you what's the most underrated game, do you think, in your opinion? 
Oh, just in general terms, most overrated, most underrated game? And whilst you're thinking, the audience, just to let you know, I don't like to script these questions. I did it yeah. once, and it doesn't feel right. I wanted to make sure everything's <laughs> fresh. Give you a proper time. Whilst you're thinking, I can say if you like the video, um, check in the description later on, because there is going to be an offer I can't refuse, <laughs> refuse you, and that is around, obviously, following uh, various things that Stephen does do. Aside from that, obviously, if you like, please share. Uh, please hit the like button, notification bell, and subscribe, obviously, bringing you more stuff as well, more things about to do with Table Talk, and, of course, other things in the playlist. So any, any thoughts on yeah, overrated or underrated? I'll go, I'll, I mean, I'll go first underrated. For, to me, thematic games are everything. I want games where the theme really shines yep. through in the game. Uh, and I just had a conversation about this game today. And while you can say this is a broken game, and people some will not play it, I love this game so much. And that's Betrayal at House on the Hill. Okay. Um, I... You know, when I'm playing that game, it's it's creepy. It plays out differently every time. And sure, yes, some of the haunts they call them haunts when you're as you're laying out the tiles and you're searching rooms and yeah, um, yeah, you're trying to work as a party, and all of a sudden there's a trigger in the game, and one of you becomes a traitor, <laughs> a bad a bad guy, right? Uh, and then you go to another room and you have to read the haunt and what your objective is, and everybody else reads what the what the everybody else subjective, the good guy's objective. I find it to be just a great experience. Some work out better than others, you know, and and that's fine. But in all cases, I still have great memories. Every time I play that game, I'll always look to play that game. Uh, it's it's just to me fun is all all get go, and I'll go that one as one of the most underrated games. It's interesting you talked about theme actually. I was going to say because my most thematic game is also a horror related one. That's Dead of Winter, which also is kind of cooperative as well. So interesting how i think the theme and maybe horror it just seems to be the thing anyway i'll get back to you about overrated maybe there's a theme there too yeah um an overrated overrated game what do i you know the, the, this the i just something just clicked um came out recently i mean within the last year or so um meadow that was what it's called you oh, know yeah? the game meadow i, I, I think, yeah. did not <laughs> like that game it just there was nothing it was it was overly confusing that you have to and, and and frustrating that was the really thing you have to ch choose something that's in this row or in this row and i'm like the, 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 again it's not a bad game and I, and I obviously it's popular so i'm wrong <laughs> so steven is wrong on this one <laughs> but to me design should remove frustration and yep. in that game it just seemed about frustration i can't choose here i want to choose here i can't as a no, uh, overrated. I I would prefer not to play it. If forced to, I would because it's not a bad game. It's just it just doesn't speak to me. So what I really like about games that stand out for me are fluidity. If I can say a game that's just straight away and I can play that, and there's one American actually I, I've played with that says fun ability, and this isn't a plug or a pitch, but I feel I do I would have another stronghold game relevant, and that is because you were a play tester, which I'll come back on uh -huh. to. Terror from Mars Ares Expedition. And again, in Terrifying Mars, the first play, time I played it, I went, oh. And then it's one of only a few games I did give a second chance. But then on the third time, and from the third time onwards only, it's because I wanted to draft in the game. And when I found people to draft, it so changed it. And it's the only way I would play it. Because if you have a bad hand, like in the game Viticulture, it's like, ugh, you're right. just stuck. And I don't know if you've seen it, but I have been um, reading this. There's a few typos, only three so far. But have you read this? It's won an award, apparently. I have not read that. No. <laughs> so yeah, this I got this sent from America. So um, I'm about 100 pages through. It's quite dry. It's but also in in sense that you know it's they're a bit bored because they're in Mars and they. Uh, but there's loads. But I mean, the last time I played Ares, they um, who is it? Thorgate is who I played as. And on the second page, they talk about Thorgate. So that's very cool. Um, so I didn't we, even. I did not know that that book exists. That's a book. That's a novel. Yeah. Aconite, which is actually Nazbadi. Oh, out. and and Aconite is putting out. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I've read um, the pandemic one came out uh, a few days ago, which I did a review for. I've read oh about six now. Two of the Legends of the Five Rings one. The what else have I read? Twilight Imperium. That was very thematic in the sense that within twenty pages they're trying to negotiate, which is brilliant. 
So they've done a very good job of actually tying the two things together. And I've read a Marvel book and, and something else. So are you um, enjoying? Are you enjoying? Yes. That book? So I'd give them all the books between like a seven and eight out of ten. You know, they're they're very good, better than I expected. And by the way, my average rating for a board game is six point three. So it's not like I'm giving. Oh, a, a so you're a top, you're a hard rater. I, not necessarily. I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> say that. I mean, I rate, for example, some of these heavy games uh, generally very high because I haven't played as many as lighter games. But equally, I have actually done a comparison of all the big reviewers who've done like 2000 plus, comparing myself mm -hmm. like Dan King, Tom Vassell, Z Garcia. And it's actually my average is quite similar to that. I mean, Jamie Stigmeyer is average is really higher, much higher. But it's very, and of course, Rado. <laughs> but apart from that, um, it's no, it's, it's definitely a bell curve. And you can see that mm -hmm. obviously, my uh, obviously, a mass games BGGs do that. And you can see what I've rated and why. And I do go to like three decimal places. Um, but no, I'd, it's been an enjoyable book so far, especially just tying it in. Like in Pandemic, you see, oh, there's a dispatcher and they're meeting the researcher. It's, it's definitely fun if you like Pandemic. So I do. Very cool. And bizarrely, Very cool. both of these books talk about football or soccer balls, which is a bit weird. So um, I was telling <laughs> um, the, the editor about that. So we need, um, we, we, need sports, we need sports on Mars, of course. I know. Why not? Exactly. There's always international people there. So I think it has to be. There's a <laughs> World Cup or the, the Mars Cup, as they call it. So what about the game? Um, what's your favorite game? I hadn't asked you that. Oh, that's an easy. That's a real, really easy one. And I get that. I get asked that often. I thought you might. And, and, and it is War of the Ring. So okay. War of the Ring absolutely does everything possible that a Stephen Bonacore would want in a game. First of all, it's about a subject that I'm... I won't call myself an expert, I mean, or a, a super expert, but I'm certainly close to an expert. I've read, of course, all the books, and I've read them multiple times, and I've seen the movies again and again. So Tolkien is huge to me. I've even read the stuff that's not part of, you know, the the, the canon, I guess you can say. Silmarillion the stuff is kind that Christopher, of canon, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, read all, I read the Silmarillion stuff a couple of times. I've read all the Christopher Tolkien stuff to, mm. that he was filling in pieces. So I love the whole genre the whole world that he created so we start with that now war that, that would not make this game no. a favorite but what makes this game my favorite game is because you're literally acting out that the, the lord of the rings book starting yeah. at the point of the council at rivendell starting from that point you're going to either as the free people's player march your way to to Mordor and Frodo or someone else dunks the ring into Mount Doom or the there's a potential for the free people to win in a military victory it ha it happens very infrequently or Frodo gets corrupted and and he succumbs and the shadow wins or the shadow players take over militarily by taking 10 points of strongholds across middle earth that's the way they they normally win it's a, it's brilliant. Every game, the, the the greatest part of that game is that really shows the great design is that every game ends in that final round of dice. It's like every time, either I'm gonna win, to, as I do. It's an action dice selection, yeah. card driven war game essentially. So very modern Euroy mechanics with the action dice and the card driven, but a war game at its heart for two, but can play with three, can play with four, yeah, play and three. and and it will always come down to that last round where they'll, you know, I'll have six dice, you'll have five dice, and then we're picking them and I'll win on the third dice, and you yeah. could have won if you would have had a couple more actions and win, won the game. The balance is amazing. Um, Aries Games just hit it out of the park with that game, and in their and in their follow-ups that they keep adding into that system or adjacent systems as well. Tangentially, a buddy of mine is coming from New Jersey. I live in Florida, if, if you're unaware. Uh, he, my, one of my old gaming buddies, he's coming down here for next week, and he and I are gonna play the crap out of that, as well as where I've never played the Battle of the Five Armies, okay. right, which is the, is the uh, shows the end of The Hobbit, right, That the, the mm -hmm. big battle with all the armies at the end of The Hobbit, so we're gonna play that. We're also gonna play Hunt for the Ring, nice. another another Ares game where the Nazgul are chasing the hobbits on their way to yep. get to Rivendell, and there's two kinds of two games in that game, and I've never played that. 
Both of those games, the outcome of those games, can affect, if you'd like, the starting condition wow. in War of the Ring. So we're obviously going to do that whole thing. It's going to be it's going to be massively fun. I don't know what our um, wives are going to do during that, but I'm sure <laughs> they'll be understanding that we're gonna we got to play these things. Exactly. Yes, and I'm guessing obviously second edition. And you did mention Stronghold. I would have mentioned otherwise because maybe there's a tie-in. I mean, obviously, I was going to ask you separately to that actually. I know roughly when obviously War of the Ring came out, but your title of obviously the company Stronghold, where did that come from? I think the name I feel is very, you know, very um, has a great caliber to it. Was what the word I was going to use with one word to describe it. But where did the name Stronghold come from for you? The the name of the company. Yeah. Ah, okay. That is a, that is an interesting question. Um, when I was first starting the company, I did have a business partner for a very short period of time, under about two years, just under two years. And uh, we were blah, 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 went through iterations of names and names and names. And finally, I just pitched Stronghold Games. And the reason that came to mind is because I have, back in New Jersey, and kind of now as well, I always called my house The Stronghold. So people were coming over to The Stronghold. My house had a, a gray brick facade. Did not look like a castle, but on some level, gray brick kind of like a, a castle. So I called it the Stronghold. People were coming over to the Stronghold to game or whatever. So I said, hey, how about Stronghold Games? And he said, yeah, boom, I had them. So then it became Stronghold Games based on that, my, the ho my house's name. <laughs> I, I'm aware that I've, literally about under half an hour before we went live, that iguanas or iguanas or however you used to pronounce it in Florida, they are burrowing. They need to be killed. They're asking people to kill them because they are burrowing under and destroying the structure in people's house in Florida. I don't know if you're seeing many uh, iguanas and if that's a problem. Well, um, I've never heard that you're allowed to kill iguanas in Florida. I mean, you're not allowed to. Well, you, I surprised me. I, yeah. I, I have not. I have not heard that um, burrowing or anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but there are plenty of iguanas here uh, and alligators, but not. I don't see alligators. I've never seen an alligator except in. No. Kind of a wild, a, a wild area. Yep. Um, uh, iguanas in my neighborhood, we don't see them very often. Plenty of lizards and things like that. But in like where my brother lives, only a couple of miles away, he's got iguanas in his backyard all the time. And friends who live closer to the Everglades, they've got lots of iguanas over there. Um, what happens during the winter occasionally in Florida? Normally, it's, it stays warm I know during the winter. Now. Yeah. <laughs> Normally, it stays very warm. The, it, the, the average daytime temperature down here in South Florida is like 75 degrees. I mean, like all year round, it gets a little warmer in the summer, gets a little cooler, but it's always warm. However, this year and the first year I got here, the temperatures like at night went really low. Yeah. As in like, uh, and I, I apologize, I can't convert that to Celsius. I, I was going to say, for those people around the world, it's, <laughs> so I used to, 30 years ago, I would have spoken with you in Imperial, but I guess we got on the bandwagon and joined everyone else. So apologies if we did invent it, I can't remember if we did. But yes, yeah, it's sorry, around 25 Celsius or something like that. So, yeah. Right. So it did get down on a couple of nights here to um, under 40, yeah. 40, 40 degrees, degrees Fahrenheit, which is like like four degrees yes. Celsius, so I was gonna speak quite about cool. freezing and yeah. So a little above freezing, it got down. And iguanas, which are cold-blooded creatures and not native yep. to Florida, they're invasive species. Yep. They start falling out of trees because yep. they hang out in trees. They try to stay warm. Their blood kind of almost stops, and they just fall. So yep. you used to have raining iguanas. It's they, they don't die, but they go into like a comatose state yep. until they warm up again. So they we, we are literally told leave the iguanas alone you see them falling you see them on the ground don't try to wake them up leave them there they'll wake up as soon as the sun comes out and then they they leave they're very they're very calm they're very they eat plants they, yeah, yeah they don't vegetarian. do anything bad i mean they don't do anything bad well, i like them i think they're kind of cute but oh they're lovely they can, can get big they yeah. they can poop a lot that's about the only thing we try to get them get them get them off of our uh, pavers and things yeah. like that. I used to um, used to breed geckos actually about 20 years ago funnily enough but the reason I mentioned iguanas is because I knew I knew about your story because it did make the BBC headlines over here so hence uh, they were <laughs> in other news I think is how they refer to that as <laughs> so um, in terms of obviously all the games you've been involved with what game would you say you're most proud of I mean it's got to be terraforming Mars I mean that's uh, I think that's an easy one to pick I mean it's sort of a 
a legacy for the company. The story behind Terraforming Mars is very interesting. Obviously, it's a licensed game, right? So it um, it came out of Sweden and it's still you know managed from a production and all of that standpoint off by Frix Games, yep. the brothers and sister Frixelius. There's actually 16 children in yes. this family. 16. Um, five brothers and a sister are part of the company. Um, so they, Jacob and the brothers, created the game. Um, they pitched it to me via a, a mutual acquaintance in Germany, um, Frank Jaeger, who is a uh, the export manager over at Ludofact, Germany. You know, we were very close because we were printing games with them. Frank came to me and said, hey, Steven, I know you do a lot of space games. So why don't you want to look at this game from this small company? They're definitely going to need help on on maybe making the game better and and uh, just how to market and stuff like that. I said, well, of course, of course. So we got the game and um, they're just nice people. Took the game back and I said, well, this game has got a lot of potential, but let's work on this a little bit more. I think we could really do a much better. It's a good game. Why don't we try to get it to a great game? So they wanted to release it like within eight months of when we first you know, saw the game at the next Essen. We made them wait. We asked them politely because we were helping them do the development. Wait another year almost to do this. They did. We came out with a great game. I had had one of the people that was working with me on game development um, and play testing to really go deep dive and work closely with them. So the game, we had some copies at Origins that year, a really small number. We had more of them at Gen Con, and then the big splash was at Essen of that year where the game took over everything. And and thankfully, it it... It made the company ripe for someone who wants to acquire it, right? Or to merge as it was with indie boards and cards yeah. first off. And then for Stephen Bonacore to say, okay, I can take a step back, take a step back. You guys got this. You don't need me. I'm a big expense. I'll go hang out, drink some wine and things like that. So Cool. I remember, yeah, literally that copy is doubled and doubled and doubled in terms of each, each print run. But I have also played on the channel, you can see this, and my Brawling Barons video, which is also by them, by different brothers, actually. And just on a separate note, during uh, Terraforming Mars, it wasn't a scripted question I had, but there was obviously Will Bricker is one of the artists, and he's uh, quite a prolific artist. How did he Bill, get involved? Yeah. Well, you know? oh, Bill, Bill Bricker was my, is my oldest employee at Stronghold Games and is still with the company. Yeah. He's still at Indie Game Studios, you know, the, the merged Stronghold in Indie yeah. Boards and Cards. Bill is, and, and Bill is a, a great friend. We've, um, we've we developed this amazing relationship over the years at my second origins i think i met bill it was one of those like he walked in to origins and i'm always at the booth i was always at the booth uh, i like the facetime with the fans with the gamers i would even demo games occasionally i normally would have people but i would demo and i would take interviews and i would sell bill came walked up and said hey i'm a graphic designer i'm an artist and graphic designer I love to work i'm a, and you know you get a hundred of these things i'm like I need somebody who work fast. He goes, I'm the fastest. I need someone who will work cheap. He goes, I'm the cheapest. I love you. Let's do it. So I took his information and then we and then we got together. And that was like in 2012, something like that. I mean, he, so he's been around with us for a long time. Uh, and he's worked on any game where he needed internal art. He did every game where we needed graphic design. He did so literally when we get um, we even bring a licensed game in, you know. So it's going to be printed, you know, by uh, Lauta Pellet out in Europe, and yep. we were going to be doing it, you know, for North America. We would get the files and we would put our information on the boxes, and he would take care of that. If we needed artwork, of course, Bill would be doing at least some, if not all, of the artwork for the game. So awesome, awesome gentleman. Um, I still consider him a very close friend, and every every convention we get together, hang out, and have a drink. Cool. Now, I knew this might be a similar question, but would there be a game that you can say you wish you had made or wish you had signed up or got onto Stronghold Games, shall we say? Anything that you think, ah, oh, we missed out on that one or something like that? Uh, the first one that just popped into my mind, because a lot of people say, well, which is the one that you lost, so to speak? Okay. The first one that just popped into my mind that I know I specifically passed on is by a company I mentioned just a little while ago, Arcane Wonders, who are very good friends. And I'd like to, play, by the way, state for the record again, that in this industry, 
Sure, a dollar spent at Stronghold might not be a dollar spent somewhere else and vice versa. We are really all friendly competitors. And that's what one of the things that makes this industry great. Yeah. We, and, and, and how do you know that? Well, because after hours at these conventions, we all hang around, sit together and have a beer and just play games together. So yeah. we really are friends it's innovative with each other. It's, it's just there. We're friends with the gamers. We're friends with each other. Uh, yeah, I want to get a game that I really want, but it went to you. Oh, well, I'll get the next one. So the Arcane Wonders uh, picked up a game called, which is pretty hot right now, Picture Perfect. And I did play that over at um, at Dice Tower West. It's another one of the games I played. I've been playing it a bunch of times recently. Um, Picture Perfect is a, a deduction game where um, you're trying to take your photographer and you're trying to take the perfect picture at an event at a gathering of people and you literally get stand up for a table little pieces of like of like cake and wine and candles that go on the table and you get 14 people standees and people one of the people is a tree one of the people is a a dog and one is a child so you have all of these standees and via uh, deduction you have to figure out where to place them on your little map um, the thing that you're hiding from everybody else. Um, but the clues are there, and in the end, nobody creates the exact same um, scene, which is amazing because you're seeing all of the information. But there's there's multiple ways of, of, of scoring these things. So someone might say, I don't want to stand next to this person. So their little, their little card would say, they don't want to okay. stand next to this person. They, they want to stand next to a man. They yep. don't want to stand on the right, they want to stand on the right side of the table or against the table or in the back row or in the front row or this. Or that. So they have all of these parameters for each one of the people. And so there's so many ways of potentially creating that. And then you have a doubler, doubling effect that you can add into somebody that you really know that you did it right for and things like that. Really, really creative way of, of doing a deduction game with a slight bit of memory involved as well. Why didn't I do that game? Good question, as you, as you asked. The reason is because the production cost on that game was I knew was gonna be very high and the licensing fee was high as well. Okay. Our, I, we don't, in the end, ask about, you know, I don't ask my good friend Robert over at Arcane Wonders, well, what are you paying for the game? And I, it's not my business. Um, but they were able to work it out on yep. a cost basis and st obviously still make money. And they have sold a lot of this game from, because I do ask him that occasionally. So how many have you sold? So he, they've sold it well and they continue to sell it well. And they've had five, six player expansion just come out and more expansions coming out. So you know the game is doing very well. So... Check that one out if you want. Cool. Uh, I did, you want to I see something really detail. interesting. I did. I do remember you mentioned this in a, in a prior video that you mentioned about that. So I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully hitting the UK market as well. Yeah, and one of the cool things about it is that it it really lends itself to social media because at the end of the game, you literally have to take your smartphone yeah. and you bring it down low and you're taking this picture of the the standees and the table and the background and you have to make sure you can't see it outside this background. You can't see the, the physical table you're playing on. It's yeah. just gotta be that scene. You take that picture and then you can prove, like some might say, I don't want anybody to see the face of this person. So you have to make sure that somebody's standing in front of that person that hides okay. them, things like that. So, and then you might post it as I always do on social media. So that it really just says, look at that. I played this game and look at my picture I took. And it's, it's a really clever way of getting people to talk about the game on social media as well. Kudos to Arcane Wonders and Picture Perfect. Fantastic game. So this sounds interesting because you might well have just answered my next question, which is what would you like to see more in board games? And you may well say things which make people take photos of it. I don't know, but I'll, I didn't want to <laughs> uh, yeah, fill, you, fill you with words there. Um, things I want to see more in board games. Um, you know, or in general, in the industry, who knows? It, yeah, I mean... You know, what do I like? I come, I'll, I'll ask, I'll answer from that and then I'll extend it. I mean, you know, the things I like are, are any, any time when we can interact. I, the one thing I, the one type of game I don't kind of go toward are the heavy Euros where it's mostly, everything is really hanging out up here in your head, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, you're going to solve a puzzle and yeah. I'm going to try to solve it better than you, right? Yeah. And there's very little, I'm sure maybe I took 
that token before you took the token as your interaction. So uh, I, yeah. I'm not into solving a puzzle and not, I want to interact with you. I want, I want to interact. So party games in general are one of my absolute favorite genres. I mean, um, you know, I'm going to have, like I mentioned before, my buddy's coming down with his wife. We're going to be playing a lot of games, and I guarantee some of those are going to be party style or social style games. So I want games with lots of interaction. I want to see more party games. One of the best games, again, I played at Dice Tower West. You're, you're making me think of all the little things. So Clover. Have you played So Clover? I know a lot about it. I haven't played it yet, but again, I may well be playing at the UK Games Expo, if not sooner. I know people have got copies, uh, so yes, I have read lots about it. It still seems like from what it is, I mean, obviously it's, it's like just one makes code names and stuff like that. But that's a that's that's kind of a good way of doing it. You certainly have certain uh, physical uh, similarities between the two, where you're writing the little notes on the different pieces of this clover, yep. and you're trying to figure out by uh, talking to each other, you're trying to figure out well, what was I driving at? So, um, great social, great party game. Um, I want to see more great party games out there. Just one is phenomenal, and Code Names, you know, is the ultimate. My my yeah. favorite thing to tell to tell people who are not into games or you know would like to figure out where they could be in games. I always say, take all of those monopolies that Grandma bought you, take exactly. them, throw them in the garbage, and take a copy of Code Names and put it there. And you're gonna play the crap out of Code Names with kids, with adolescents, with adults, with Everybody, everybody can play code names with you, and you'll have so much more fun in such a much shorter period of time than playing a game of, you know, Monopoly. Or you can add in almost all the mass market games that just not good games. The brain brain candy that in in a modern world don't work. So party games uh, that that make gamers happy, I guess, is a good way of of going exactly. with that kind of idea. So um, in terms can, of things like Monopoly, I, I have got a video which I've had made a while, but I've kept on with all my daily videos. I keep pushing it back. But basically, it's a very brief history of board games. And a little bit of that involves with is the fact that between the two world wars, we had Monopoly. And from Monopoly, it had a lot of copies there. There was not much else out there. And when you have it, when you're after the Second World War, well, what do you have? Well, you buy the one game and you're still staying at home because there's nothing else to do. So you're playing that one game. It passes down in generations. They tell you about that game and you buy it again. I have been to Hasbro's headquarters. I said, why don't you just have a deck of, you know, the chance cards, community chess cards. When they run out, obviously the game ends. You have a time pile effect. So obviously, you know, when to switch, that kind of stuff. And uh, yes, yeah, a few other things, but back when I was a child, you know, as scouts, funny enough, coming full circle to that, I, I was given, it was like a pub quiz, but obviously with scouts, and during our fish and chips half time moment, where everyone was given a blank Monopoly board, every team, and I said, I'll do it. And I got 40 out of 40 for all the, all the, for all the places. But in terms of code names, oh. Um, well, the code names won the Spiel des Jahres, and Spiel des Jahres is fantastic in the sense that it, one of their criteria is interactivity. So there's that, and fun is another one. So I highly like those. Obviously, uh, I predicted about seven in the row. I predicted, yeah, the follow up, obviously, King Domino and Quacks of Quidlinburg. And Just One also won it, and I played the prototype. It was called Under Construction by Repos. And I played it on behalf of Asmodee. It's the inaugural uh, tabletop gaming live session in London. So uh, moving on to uh, something which you might be of interest, and also I think No Thanks is one of my highly rated games. All those games we talked about just then, I give like nine out of ten. So guess what? I also played. I played No Thanks at Dice Tower West. Yeah, we kept problem. pulling the small ones off the shelf to like fill some time in. But yeah, that's a fantastic little game. Love like, it. I just love that. It's my best score's minus six, and I once was eating a burger. And I said, I, I don't want to get a dirty, and it was my copy. So I said, can you just pick a card, and I'll, I'll have that card, and I'll have that. And literally, I didn't even touch my cards, and I actually happened to win the game as well. So <laughs> it was like, oh, wow, it's just one, of those, one of those moments which I'll come back on to. But awesome. do, you, do you think you may ever create a game, or ever, ever consider creating a game? You know, it, it, that's a, a very, very interesting question. I, um, um, I've always said that everybody has a game inside them that they, that they could bring out want to bring out, think they can bring out, any of those things. Um, could I design a game? We can design a game right now, right? I'm sure yeah. I could, right? I'm sure that we could, if I gave it even a few hours of thought, marrying How a couple fast things. How paper drop? Cards, <laughs> that's it, done. You know, hey, maybe, I'm gonna give a plug here, sort of for a good friend of mine. Oh, I can't reach it, it's over, it's over there on my shelf. I have the um, Jeff Engelstein's book, 
elements of essentials of tabletop design. Okay. Building blocks of tabletop game design. I cannot recommend this book enough to any aspiring game designer um, because literally him and Isaac Shalev, two good friends of mine, Jeff, really good friend. I lived, you know, 20 minutes from him in New Jersey back in the day. He's been over to my house here in Florida. Um, he, they have put together this encyclopedia of game mechanics. And, and you could literally look at that book, read that, and then pull pieces together, so to speak, to create game designs and consider how one would implement the perfect or a worker placement game, a deck building game. Maybe you want to combine those two things. It's, it's phenomenal. So check that out if you're interested. Back to the main question here. Should I do a design? One of the things that I always have said is that, you know, I know a good game. I know a great game. I know what games will sell most of the time. Uh, but, you know, I leave the game design to the people who are smarter than me. <laughs> I'm not going to be designing a game anytime soon. Uh, unless I get really bored and Tom Vassell says, let's design a game together because that would be really, really silly. So Him and me on the box. So that sounds interesting how he mentioned, oh yeah, he literally have his, you know, his seal of approval or whatever. Maybe have, maybe have the castle upside down, who knows? So. He, would, he would say seal of approval, but then he'd stamp my name like, you know, denied or something yeah. like that. Have the, the dice tab on the side or something. So you mentioned, obviously, you think you know what sells or you think you know what sells. Curious to delve into that more about how did you, so how have you noticed, you know, that's going to work or that, that magic, that click or, or what hasn't, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I always, you know, when I was trying to get new games in, I always tried to say, listen, you, you, you want something that that excels in one or more um, of, of the categories that I like to say mechanics, thematics, or fantastics. I made up that word. It's my word, trademark Stephen Bonacore. So clever. You want, you want it to try to excel, and then after excelling, you, you need something unique in a game to really want to do that game. Because... Right now, unless you're creating something brand new mechanic, never been done, right? Dominion set a, a standard, right? That was deck building, which even you might not even say that was new because you had kind of magic, right? You had deck building before you played a game of, of a CCG. But and Scopa, 1600s game from, the, yeah. from Italy is kind of similar as well. But yeah. Right, yeah, you had that. So unless you're creating something like that, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to, to make something unique but you can combine things in unique ways, and that kind of what works, I think, these days, that you're combining things in ways that people haven't quite thought about, and then maybe they're adding this really cool theme, and maybe it's just so much fun, right? So I just mentioned all those little pieces together. Will it necessarily sell? There's lots of factors, because since there's 2,000 games that come out on one day every year, one day, Essen, 2,000 new games come out, you're never going to hear of 1,900 of them a week later. You're not going to hear about 1,950 of them three months later. And with any luck, you know, 40, 30 of them will stay around for a little while until just a few shake out and, and become, you know, a, well, there's a really good games. You never know if something is end, end up going to sell, but you got to try to think outside the box, perver the proverbial game box to really make something that's going to stand out. I think um, the Spiel des Jahres, obviously, the awards committee have a lot to say about probably at least 10 of them, which obviously, and the Deutsche Spiel Prix and stuff like that, which really help to maximize and alleviate and promote that awareness, I would say, of, of, of those ones. And mm -hmm. um, in terms of moving on to, I guess, playtesting Aries, how did that come about? I mean, obviously, you're at an arm's length, be like, yeah, I want to get involved. Or, or do they just say, yeah, do you want to playtest? And I was wondering what else you have playtested. And was that a game that you thought, yes, this works? Um, now, we're talking about Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition, Expedition right? Um, so here's my entire um, uh, involvement in that game. I playtested the game. Um, Hmm. I don't know. I'm trying to remember if it was six to ten months before uh, I retired. I retired in August of 2020, right in the midst of COVID. And uh, uh, Nick Little and Sidney Engelstein came to me and said, we're working on this. We play tested. I said, 
you got all the concepts of terraforming Mars in here, but it needs some work. It's just, it's, you know, the, the, the card play isn't really working for me, but you got something pretty cool here. Just keep going. And I think this could be a, a phenomenal uh, add-on to the terraforming Mars line. Da, 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 da. Bonacore retires. Da, 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 da. They get a final game design that gets, that gets play tested a lot. They work with Fricks to say this is going to work. And then the rest is kind of history as a second great game in the terraforming Mars line. So I had very, very, that literally that one, two play tests and times that I actually was involved with looking at that game is all that I did. The team at Stronghold slash Indie Boards and Cards is yep. phenomenal. Um, I think I'd like to think that I left the company in a great way to just continue. They're just smart people. Sydney kind of took over my role even, you know, a young woman um, who, who was a designer in her own right. That's by the way, that's Jeff Engelstein's daughter. I was going to ask. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, so, you know, she was a designer in her own right. And every, when, when we brought out space cadets, uh, with the original space cadets, it was designed by Jeff Engelstein, Brian Engelstein, his son, and Sidney Engelstein. They were pretty darn young when that came out, but they were integrally involved. Space Cadets, Dice Duel, they were integrally involved in those games. Uh, and we continued to do games with them, several games with them, the whole family. As I was leaving the company, we hired Sydney, now an adult, out of college, and she has done an amazing job and, and will continue into the future. So kudos to them for bringing this to life and continuing to keep the cohesiveness of the company uh, together for the long term. Cool. Well, now we're going to lighten the mood a bit because I can ask you what's the funniest moment you've had in board games or in the industry, shall we say, in general? Ooh, yeah, you really ask like, ah, you want me to think really hard. The Sorry. funniest. The it's funniest party moment. moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's not meant to be. It's not a puzzly question. It's not. It's party. It's not puzzly. Um, it's not a fail. Um, it's more of a, yeah, an, a, a village fossil's kind of easier one, shall we say, or more of a Wolfgang Walsh is easier one. Who knows? <laughs> how about uh, I, I, a Port Royal, a little, not a Maracaibo? <laughs> I have a really bad. Uh, I had a really not bad. I had a really uh, embarrassing moment in the, in recent history, but one of the. Yeah, I will go with that one. What the heck? So um, at um, Gen Con, at Gen Con this past year, um, I'm part of the Dice Tower Network. So I was uh, involved in the Gen Con show. I was up on stage for a couple of things. And uh, one of the things we did was a top 10 list. In fact, that was the, the main part of the show. So I think I was there the whole time, right? So we did a top 10 list that with like six people giving their top 10 games with bad names. Oh, yes. I, I watched that one. Well, either my humor failed or people just, you know, or Tom just likes to beat, beat me up. So he, every time I mentioned something, he just punched me down. So, so one of the ones I said, one of the worst names is 870, oh, 878 the, the Vikings. Vikings. Yeah, yeah. Why is it 879 Vikings? Why is it 870? Why is it 900 Vikings? Why is it? He's like. Are you serious? I'm like, no, I know it means the year, but it's a terrible, it doesn't even say the year on the box. It's yeah. eight, seven, nine Vikings. Yeah. I don't, it's just a bad name. Give an AD, give something that indicates that this is actually a year, not a I number. Agree. I tried to make a joke. The joke didn't quite work. Or, or, or just Tom's a pain in my bum. So <laughs> it didn't work. It's a little embarrassing. I might've got a little red, but that's fine. It was entertaining. A lot of people liked it. Some thought I was an idiot. I'm okay with that. So I remember, so actually I did do a, I'm studying doing some solo things recently. So I did a solo video playthrough actually of um, Ares Expedition. But the week prior, it was actually another game, which um, it was a, a year game, let's call it, 1565 St. Elmo's Pay, which again is a historic related title. But in terms of, I was actually mentioned this earlier, I think Crown of Amara, it's quite an odd title. It didn't grab me. And another the pick as a Spieler game, when I, all I saw was a name, and this is before it even came out in Germany, was Micro Macro. And I was like, hmm, okay, what is that? It, it's, it didn't grab me as a title, strangely. Right. I mean, when you see the box, it's like, wow. And it's pretty much my game of the month. I mean, I, I've had both of them. So, I mean, so those games and things like Cartographers, I had, had them so far in advance that by the time everyone else is playing them, I'm like, 
Oh yeah, I've, I've played them now. <laughs> I've played them all and all the rest. Old it's, news. <laughs> it's bizarre. It's very weird. It's kind of like, oh yeah, I've, you know, do you want to play that? Well, we could, but I, can we play something different now? <laughs> um, but this now we're going to flip it around. Literally, that that smiley face to say most most. Um, I guess most stressful moment. Has it ever had anything like I don't know, palettes not arrived for a convention or whatever it might be. Yeah, I mean, I'll just go with that one. I mean, um, one year at Essen, um, you know, we had all of our new games um, could not get to the fair in time for the opening. And it's actually happened twice where sometimes they've arrived literally the morning of the opening of the show. And some of them arrived the day after. So you have to like hang up a sign, um, you know, whatever. Free collection game. tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Is coming is coming tomorrow, so stay tuned. And then you're still like waiting to make sure. Ludofact Germany is so stressed out, um, and I mean that like literally, like the people slash their systems and their you know and their and their pr production line is so stressed that they're producing games up until the, during the show and still bringing games in from Jettingham. I can't pronounce the name of the, 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 the German city where they're actually located right. as they have to truck them for two or three hours into Essen and try to get them there the morning of the show. And because you can't like wheel pallets in in the middle of a 200,000 person show, yeah, yeah. you know, right, right there. So that's definitely, definitely one of them. Um, I've had other ones that are a little harder to talk about. Um, and I never like to say I don't talk about anything, but I, I'll mention it and... Um, there was a not very publicized case, uh, but it, it got, it got notor a little bit of notoriety. I just didn't talk a lot publicly about a problem with Great Western Trail, where, you know, we own the rights to Great Western Trail, and then Eggert Spiele um, sold the company over to uh, 2F Spiele, uh, not 2F Spiele, sorry, to um, um, F2Z, not F2Z, even, um, yeah, was it? Sophie Gravel's company. I just oh, yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, no, I think it was the one or the the, the new one, the, the the next the Plan B, Plan B plan games. B. Sorry about that. B, slightly, slight, yeah. slight, slight. Sold it over to Plan B games, and then they refused to honor the contracts. Well, you can't do that legally. You cannot legally. You buy a company, you buy its assets, you buy its liabilities, you buy yeah. the company, including the contracts. And they said, sorry, you can no longer print the game. Whereas my contract was valid for another year or so. Oh, really? Well, that, that started up a, a legal case, which didn't get to court, settled out of court. And all I'm allowed to say was, is we are very pleased with the outcome. You can fill in any blank you'd like there. Yeah. So. I know so normally that, three years is one where with other companies, they have like a three year contract. Here you go. You sell as much as you can to prove that obviously you can do a great job, but every company is different. You can, you can nod and agree. I don't know if you're familiar with normally three years and stuff, but... Uh, I do not know that. That's not a US thing, maybe, or something, but uh, we had a contract that lasted through quite a bit longer, and they would not allow us to print the game. So, okay, well... Okay, interesting. The, court, so, the, courts, the courts took care of that. Okay, so we're on the home straight now. I've got uh, only, the, the only last kind of six or so questions, and those are something a manufacturer is keen to actually ask me to ask anybody, to be honest, and you're the first I'm going to be plugging or asking, not plugging any manufacturer, but just asking these particular questions. But before I do mm -hmm. that, I had one, one or two others, which was, what do you think designers shouldn't do? So if you're looking to have them pitched to you, what do you th say they should not do, you know, i.e. they should not do a roll and move game, for example, I don't know. What should a, uh, a designer not do um, in general? Like what types of games? Is that kind of what you're asking? Um, or well, just I'm going to just, I mean, I have a list of about 12 things I'm going to do, do a video for, but it could be something like don't design an expansion for your game already or don't um, do not do the artwork yet or or something like that. I don't know. Well, you, yeah, I mean, that's okay. There's this at least at least a couple of things there. You, you should never say, and I have expansions, like, oh, I have all these expansions. Well, why aren't they in the game? Correct. You you could say um and the game has quite a bit of expansion possibilities if it's successful and you leave it there for the nice. publisher to keep that in mind and then if the publisher might say oh well what part of this game would you expand and then you can talk about it you don't want to overburden the pitch right you right. want it you, you want the game to stand 
Uh, and, and this is the game of design, and this is the game I believe you can sell. Oh, and by the way, there's ways that we can expand it if it's successful, and the publisher can take it from there. Never go out and do your own artwork. I mean, unless you're an artist as well, and you can show that you you could do this, maybe, maybe you're pitching that, hey, and I can do the art for you if you want as well, we'll have to have a, a separate agreement or an agreement that would that would bring the art in or something like that. Always go steal, air quotes, as much artwork from the internet as you can possibly find for your prototype. That's allowed. You're not selling it to me yet. You're showing it to me. You're showing a vision. If you put some Star Wars art on there or some, some Lord of the Rings art, if it's a fantasy game, that's okay because you're showing what you believe the game could look like. Yeah. The publisher is responsible for going out and sourcing the artwork, going and producing the artwork from, from artists and th things like that, or licensing existing art, as the case may be. Never spend money on artwork. Never spend money on, you know, I mean, you know don't, don't go crazy and, and try to have the game, you know, actually printed before you're pitching it. Well, that doesn't make sense. You can go to GameCraft or one of those places to get a prettier prototype. And, and then in, in adding that in, you kind of want to have a pretty prototype because it shows that you have a vision and you took the care to do that. I actually have people co have come to me with a piece of paper that was crayoned in. And I was like, what, what, what is this? I, I mean, these days you could easily find or, or cre get enough skill in, in, a fo in Photoshop or something to yeah. simply create something that just looks a little bit nicer. So be proud of what you're doing and create something that's a little bit better than just pencils and crayons uh, when you do a presentation. Okay. That's, that's sort of part of it. Your presentation is going to have an impact on the publisher and what we believe you, your vision is. Make it good. Okay. So in terms of getting publishers interested in your game, did that answer the same question, would you say? Or was there anything that you think they should do? So now we're on to a separate question and not necessarily the inverse, but what do you think should get, what would yeah. get them interested in you? What do, yeah. what do they it, have to get publishers to be interested in you as a designer? In the modern, in, in, in the, in the modern uh, and, and during and post COVID world, um, having a digital implementation uh, of your game, and I don't mean like a slick one, a real slick one you can play, like getting your game onto like a, uh, a tabletop simulator where you can show how this game might look and okay, then here I'm gonna have cards and the cards will, if you can do that, and that there's a little skill that you have to either do or have somebody do for you, but presenting the game over the internet so that we don't have to sit in the same room, which we couldn't do for over a year anyway, yeah is really gonna give you a leg up. Then you don't necessarily have to be at all the conventions with the publishers, right? Then you need to know your market, right? So should you pitch a children's game to Stronghold Indie? Probably not, that's not a market that we're in. Got a children's game, who do you pitch it to? Maybe Haba, be the first company that comes to mind, right? Um, things like that, know the market, very important, know the publishers that have done games like this that might be interested in your game and then figure out a way to, to get to them and digital implementations, digital simulations of your game are gonna make it a lot easier for the publisher to interact with you. And, and, and just to throw in, if you can't do it on a tabletop simulator because it's too hard, too much time, you don't know how to use those tools, get a good system in your, in your house that you can have a camera showing it here, have a camera showing it there, and then you know, and then you can work with the, the publisher, or, or or at least have a little boom that you can show them different angles of your game while you're talking to them and things like that. Be prepared, be ready to pitch to them in a modern, non-in-person way. A lot of people don't even go into the office any, these days in a non-in-person way because that's the way the world has evolved, and certainly publishers publishers can see more games. If they're not stressed out at a convention, yeah. they can see more games from their offices versus they can in person. Yeah, I have done um, some demos for Pe for Pegasus Spieler actually for Port Royal, the board game, and uh, yeah, using a camera and doing it that way. And I know that for Tabletopia, some people didn't like the rule books for some 
games they want to implement. So these are just developers just practicing their art. And they said, oh, yeah, by the way, I've used your, your video to show me how to do it. That was for Rats to Riches, amongst other things. So cool. um, how do you choose your components during game design? What would you say, have any, any views on that about, I mean, of course, Terraforming Mars, you may have had an input, you know, the types of uh, components that were used. Any, uh, did you have any of that flavor? Like, oh yeah, we want to go with uh, recess boards or we want to go with ever. Do you get involved with that at all? Well, I certainly have had to do that on multiple occasions. Uh, um, you, you, selecting the type of component for a given game. Um, you know, there's the, then there's the, there's the trade-off when you do those things of like, how much do you want to produce the game? Which means how much is the cost going to go up of the game versus how simple you want to make the game. I don't think you need to make a card game that happens to have cards and a, and a few chits all of a sudden have mi miniatures in it, right? Uh -huh. I mean, it's just, there's this trade-off of that, like why produce a game so strongly when it's a simple game. But when you have a bigger game going with bigger components, your price point can go way up. Um, you want to show that. Then, of course, you have, if you're going with a crowdfunding platform, right, Kickstarter, GameFound, um, putting more production into the game is going to be a bigger selling point. And since you're getting more money up front, you can go with bigger um, pieces of bigger production items. Um, Terraforming Mars is railed upon in a lot of ways because it doesn't ha didn't have in the box dual layer player boards. Well, very few people when that game came out had done dual layer. Nobody had, except for like Scythe did it. A couple of, Scythe, of yeah. those games uh, started doing that and they were Kickstarter games. So they, they were able to do that. All of a sudden that became almost a standard. Mm. We never went and re-implemented that because, well, that was the game. This is the way it was. If you want those, you can pay a little bit more money yeah. in the secondary market, which we made them. Uh, and we had them there on Board Game Geek to buy or conventions to buy if you wanted to do layers later on. Um, so it's all a matter of where are you going to market it and how big the game is to how much production you want to put into it. Exactly. I don't think every game needs to be an $80 MSRP yeah, game. Supply demand. Right? Why, why can't we still make games, some of us still make games that are, that are $20 or even less? Or yep. then you want, or of course on the higher end you make the bigger game. So you you, you want to balance your catalog a lot. I, I I liked one of the things I loved that I did at Stronghold was I had a game for everybody's budget and everybody's taste. I didn't I didn't stop at plastics games. I didn't stop at Euro games. I didn't stop at card games. I just did I just I did everything. I wanted to be a place where well what is Stronghold doing in deck building, and then you would find, oh, look, they have Core Worlds, they have that game. So I wanted a place where people can come and say, what is Stronghold doing in this? Oh, maybe I'll try that one out. Cool. Well, Core Worlds is awesome on the channel as well. And it's interesting, because I was thinking about oh, that dual layer boards, and if the games like Ticket to Ride, you might want to do your counter at the end in case they get knocked. But that whole idea of the track around the edge, the Kramer track, obviously designed by Wolfgang Kramer, of course, you that's the kind of thing we need perhaps a dual layer board but of course you would never be able to get that on a on a board in you know, a board game so i found that's, right, that's right, quite right. of interest um yep. and in terms of obviously if someone wants to create a game kickstarter is a way with that you obviously will need to get your own artist i don't know if you have any views on let's say independent artists of course different to in-house artists which are yourself big potato and people like that do i say we obviously the royal we <laughs> And so your views on Kickstarter and whether or not they should consider it. For example, um, Kickstarter, if, if you're not certain, you know, if you think that you've got a certain view and someone like Sagrada, the, uh, it was Floodgate, had the idea of actually inserting, obviously, the stained glass inside. But I just wondered your views on Kickstarter against self-publishing or going with a publisher. No, so so what you're, what you're asking is uh, if, you're a, if you're a designer, just getting onto Kickstarter and putting your game up there versus bringing it to a publisher. Correct. It does, I, I, always, I always like to think, of it, well, what do you want? What do you want out of life? Where do you want to be in five years? It's a great interview question. Um, it's, it literally is, do, are, you, are you looking to put your name on a box, you know, turn over design, and then move on to your next design? And move on to that. Yeah, then you're a designer, right? Or, or are you looking to start a publishing company? And do you have the skills to start a publishing company. I don't mean that facetiously, right? right. It's not everybody is necessarily good at business, right? They, 
great des there are plenty of designers out there that have never published their own games because it's a whole other skill set. It's a whole other set of headaches to deal with. And then while you're dealing with those headaches, you can't be designing games, right? You're just, there's only so many hours in a day. You got to yep. sleep, you got to eat. So what do you want to do? I'm obviously as a publisher, former publisher, I'd always say, you got a great design, find a great publisher for it. That's what I would suggest. So, and, and then if you really have this design that, you know, this game that, that, that could really do with some great production, like maybe you really want miniatures in the game, well then go with a company that's got good experience on Kickstarter yep. or GameFound and suggest and see, feel them out. Will you put it up there? Because I think it could do better there and maybe do better for you as a designer and maybe do better for the publisher. And if they got experience, they'll do that. I think that's the calculus that has to go on in your head. I don't think there's a perfect answer there, but it's more like, Neither where sure. do you want to spend your time? Do you want yeah. to create a company and run a company? Or do you want to design games? And I think that's the spectrum of where, what you want to do. Cool. By the way, we, we are definitely live. We've got some viewers. I can see that. I can't see the comments boxes, just to let you know. So we have been watching. We have been getting a few different eyeballs on this. But in terms of game found, obviously, they're, a, they're a, a different kind of entity. Obviously, they're Awaken Realms related, so very miniatures to a degree. But I don't know. In my view, you'd probably go to Kickstarter. You'd try a publisher. If, they don't, if no one interested in you, then maybe do Kickstarter. But if you wish, I would say once you're big enough on Kickstarter and you want to stay that way, then GameFound, would you transition? Would you probably say that's the way as opposed to just jump on GameFound instead? Because it's a smaller community. It's about a seventh of the size, approximately. The cost's about the same. But I don't know how much uh, you know about them. You're, you're, you're saying, how would, how, how would I go? F how would do you I believe Kickstarter is versus GameFound? Yeah, would you prefer it's, going um, with GameFound? Yeah. Right. So, so it's, it's very interesting. I mean, I think GameFound has done unbelievable, um, has made unbelievable strides. Uh, in in this world, in fact, Ignasi predicted we do an annual. Um, let me, I'll plug a little bit here. Uh, I'm I'm on Board Games Insider. That's my podcast. We both we both have it as an audio podcast, and we put it up on the Podfather of Gaming YouTube channel, so you can see us live talking. If you do that, or in recording talking, um, and we have an annual predictions episode. And there, Ignasi said that Game Found in twenty. 22 will be as much as 15% of what Kickstarter is in gaming. And now, I, I actually disagree that it wouldn't quite make it, but now I think he's going to win that prediction. GameFound has done amazing things. They continue to impress me on the way that they're modifying the platform. Yeah. They're so much better of a platform than Kickstarter is. Yeah. They're changing things in a material way to make it better for the content creators, for the publishers that are putting things up there. I think in the end, they're going to get a bigger and bigger and bigger slice. I would almost say at this point, go right to GameFound because you're going to have less headaches putting it. And you'll maybe stand out from the proverbial crowd, right? Right? Because yeah. the, the, there's a crowd on Kickstarter of all of these Game projects, respect, perhaps, these days. Or do what? I'm sorry. So more respect potentially. Like, oh wow, they're on Game Found. They must be prestigious. Maybe <laughs> that's right. Because only some of the interesting, in, more interesting, some of the bigger ish, like Simon, of course, who's the yeah, biggest the overall. Ones are they have not went over. Once they go over, I think it's like the death knoll for games on Kickstarter. I think it'll be a first flood over the game. Man. And they were like the first. So, um, I, I would say at this point. Give GameFound a shot. I mean, good guys doing the right work. Uh, probably, and I have not done this research, better pricing. It's very, very you know? similar. It's like literally you're talking about 0.1% in it, and it kind of works oh. out of that. You do lose out. If you if your project doesn't fund, you get penalized with Game GameFound. That's about it. Okay. But in terms of uh, one, one actually publisher, like a first-time publisher, they said to me, how about I go live on both platforms? Now, obviously, you could have to meet your minimum thresholds. Do you think that's an idea? Do you think there's a, the Venn diagram is pretty crossed over there? That's the first time I, for everything. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I assume that you could. And what if you fund on one and don't fund on the other? I mean, I don't know how that would work. Do you, do you, do you say you put the same exact on both? Yeah, so no if, fees you fund, if you fund on one, you don't fund on the other, 
you go with it. If you fund on both, you go with it. Yeah. Fund on neither, you don't go with it. I, I don't know the Pledge ins one. and outs. Never thought about that one. That's interesting. Yeah. Hey, I want to give a shout out to Joseph Lee because I can see the comments over oh, here. Fantastic. Maybe you can. I can't. Joseph, so Joseph Lee. He says it's the Podfather. Thank you, Joseph Lee, for uh, for listening. Thank you very much. So yeah, literally about two more things left. So um, with marketing, um, any recommendations on marketing? Marketing is one of the hardest things of all to do. Um, and if you don't have any specific marketing background, hire someone who does. Um, you know, one of the things right when we merged the companies, we hired uh, Off Duty Ninja as Kira. our marketing expert. And it's Kira. You know Kira. She Kira messaged me about company. 10 minutes ago. Yeah. So that, um, this is how I got, well, some of the stuff I've seen. Some of the stuff you see on the channel. And I do have an indie boards and videos. Yeah. So, Kira has been great. Yeah, I I once, so this is a little bit about me, which you may not know, and others, if they haven't seen this, because of, hopefully you'll share it and they'll discover it that way, is I have been demonstrating a lot in, in pubs and stuff, and I would Good. actually, someone from Asmodee came over and said, uh, oh, yeah, um, I've moved locally, I see you're doing this stuff, and I was doing it every other week, then I did it weekly, then I did it every day at different venues, and Excellent. I was up at the UK Games Expo, and happening to be demonstrating and publishers are talking to me and I was just waving at that 60 different people a day who I knew and they said, do Instagram, do YouTube. And I said, no. Four years later, I said, fine, all right, I'll give it a go because they said, we'll give you games. And then literally 60 arrived in one day and some of them were via, kind of via Kira. I was like, whoa. So yeah, I haven't really looked back and I've been very, very flattered that people are watching and it's like 3 million impressions so far on the channel. It's been very happy. Oh, and, that's fantastic. Yeah. And so I give a big, big shout out to Kira and Off Duty Ninja and all of her people. Um, I highly recommend using her, her company or another to do some of that work for you because marketing is a skill in and of itself. Um, I think that my marketing at Stronghold early on was me, right? My personality, me being on yep. every possible podcast and every possible live stream and everything. That was sort of the only way that I could do it. Um, and I, I think I was relatively successful. That's why I didn't create this moniker, here. by the way. I did not create the Podfather. The other podcasters started calling me the Podfather, which was a colliding of the Godfather, my Italian-American heritage, and podcast. So they called me the Podfather for being on all of their shows. And then in retirement, I used the name the Podfather of gaming going forward. So yes, marketing. Marketing good, marketing exactly. the company, marketing your face. Yep. You can't you can't do enough marketing. Very important thing to try to do early on, especially. <laughs> the big difference between marketing and advertising, because I have worked in marketing, is advertising. It's making you aware of a product, but marketing, well, actually, in some degree, is a bit like Optrex, whereby they're making you sell something you don't even need. But it's different with board games because, of course, there is a need. So, on to the final one of these ones, and this is two kind of quick wrap-up questions: Is how do you price a game? How do you obviously you've had to do this from a business perspective? Do you think you know? in dollars, you know, $60, we think that's the price point from the UK, maybe 40 pounds as a standard modern mid price kind of winning game. What's, what's your view on price? Well, um, you have to make money. Businesses can't be viable unless they make money. And the board game industry is no different in, uh, in the way that it, it has a tiered distribution model, which in some ways is quite flawed but this is the model that most people end up using, especially in the United States, where a publisher sells to a distributor, a distributor sells to a retailer, a retailer to a customer. You end up, and people don't quite understand this, but this is just the fact of the way it works, that you end up having to have um, your MSRP, right? Your suggested retail price, manufacturer's suggested retail price, has to be five or more times um, your your landed cost. What's a landed cost? The landed cost is the production cost, which is a per unit cost. It's an allocated cost of all of the artwork that went into it, and as well as the, and any other money that went into the game, as well as the transportation cost, which as we know has skyrocketed in recent history. So when you get that all together, you have what's called a landed cost, and you've got to calculate and or predict on some level what that's going to be because you don't know until the final thing what the transportation cost is, you get that number, and then your MSRP has got to be five or more times that number. 
That's the simple calculus. And in licensing, if licensing is involved in this thing too, that's got to get put in. So that might sound like, oh my God, you mean you, you spend $5 a, a, on a game and you charge 25 or 30? Yes, because the $30 that you have to pay for that game, we have to sell it for 15 to a distributor. Actually, sorry, we have to sell it for 12 to a distributor who sells it for 15 to a retailer who then has to sell it to you at 30. They have to make a big chunk of money, the biggest chunk of the money, because once they get it, it sits in inventory there and they've got to keep the lights on, they got to pay their family to eat and their employees and all that. The retailer actually gets the biggest portion of that MSRP. It's the way it has to work. Um, and that's the calculus and that's the math. The more you can sell games up front via crowdfunding or via pre-orders on a website, the, the easier it is to get your distribution, um, to not get hurt in the distribution model, which, which is where you're gonna do your bulk of your sales. Things are changing with Kickstarter, and things are changing with more direct sales, but overall that model stands the test of time, so to speak, it's been around and that's the way yep. it's gonna work a lot moving forward and the way it has always worked. Cool, so my last two questions. One is there's a game called Stronghold which is obviously a game made by Stronghold Games. Is that because they, whoever came up with it, I don't know much, I haven't played it, but I don't know some people have it. I hope to get around to it, it's always the way. But do they say, guess what, I've got a game, and it's, it's gonna be easy to market, or what, what happened there? That's a great story around that game. That game is designed by my good buddy, Ignacy Chevichek. Portal Games, yep. early, or early-ish on in Portal Games, but not really, because Portal Games is actually an older company. They started doing one thing 20 years, 20 something years ago, and then Ignacy was designing games, and you know, for the last 12, 14 years, he's been designing games and bringing in licensed games. Anyway, early on, I created the, you know, we created the company Stronghold Games, and we're looking to bring in other games. We started with Survive and, and Confusion and Code 777. And then we started looking to license games. And I saw this new game coming out in Poland called, called Stronghold. And I, I reached out to them and I said, hey, I got this company called Stronghold Games in America. Uh, we'd like to, to work. I think we a great branding opportunity if we did it with you. Um, we've heard great things about it. It's a, it's a castle defense game. What do you think, can we talk? I got back a three-word answer from Ignacy, who probably was answering his own emails. I think he was answering his own customer service. No, thank you. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Ignacy said to this day, it was his single worst decision he ever made in, in all of his company. What happened was he gave the original production of the game to this company, Valley Games, which is slightly ahead of Stronghold in, in their business curve. They had been around a few more years but we're making some bad business decisions. He had given the game to them. They screwed it up. Sorry, I'm gonna be very frank here. They ended up going out of business. They, they wouldn't, him and Ignacy, them and Ignacy had an argument over rights. Ignacy said, you've got no rights, took it back, gave me the game, and we did like a second edition of the game later on. So it was a great branding opportunity. It, it, it solidified and already, already had a friendship with Ignacy. It solidified a great friendship with him and we created the podcast that we started doing at that time, and it was great. So that's that's the story of Stronghold. Cool. Well, Ignacy's also said no thank you to me in the sense that I suggested collaborating, and there's over 140 publishers have you know sent me stuff, but uh, for whatever reason, you know, I do have Alien Frontiers downstairs, which I still actually haven't opened yet, but there is a portal game for me to play. So um, I've, we do have even more watches, and again, I can't see the comments currently. I'll see if I can figure that out with a new uh, system. But you've talked about Essen a few times. That was how I was going to end this. So um, are you going to Essen? I may be going this year. I have been before. And uh, last time I spoke to Tom Vassell in person actually was there because I brought custard creams, which is a British uh, confectionery cake thing, biscuit. And he said, oh, no, something healthier next time. He ate them because um, Luke Hecht, amongst others, are eating them. And he said, oh, they've all been eaten. And I said, yeah, they've been eating them. And then, yeah, they're really good. So I was going to bring nuts next time, which is a bit healthier. Do you have any, any, any anticipation of obviously going over to Essen again? Is that something in your agenda or who knows? I, I have missed Essen greatly um, oh, you know, over the last couple of years. So obviously it didn't happen at all in 2020. Um, I had retired in 2020, but had every 100% was gonna be going 
simply as myself. I mean, yeah. I didn't have to go or anything like that. I was going to go. It didn't happen. In 2021, I was scheduled to go, but the convention still wasn't the same. They still it wasn't this. Asthma Day didn't go. A lot of people didn't go. I'm like, you right. know what? Let me go when the let me go when the Essen Fair is is the same again. So right now, I anticipate going. I booked a hotel already, so wow. I'm ready to go. If it works out, I mean, I hope it does. Yeah, um, but I look forward to seeing everybody. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think masks are mandatory this year. So for the 20, I should have a press pass. I had a press pass for the UK Games Expo last year. And for 2020, I did have um, a kind of special thing for Spiel Digital. So um, I had been sent, as I mentioned, numerous games uh, in lockdown. And thankfully, a lot of them were exhibiting for, for the expo, obviously, digitally. And they said, well, you can only be an exhibitor or a press person if you've actually got games or videos to show. And thankfully, I had 38. So on the very front page, and click on games, it's just it's all my stuff. So that was really cool. And, and hopefully, because I've done it the last two years, I should have one this year. And we hope to drive. And we do know people close by in, uh, in nearby, like Doisborg, which is very close to Essen, to hopefully stay with and visit. And I did demo uh, some games in German over there, which is a bit impromptu. They just didn't have someone ready to speak German. So the, my, my wife's German, in case you weren't aware of that. So that does oh, help. Oh, cool, cool. So she has done some translations. She's done some write-ups of rule books and stuff. So if not this year, we hope it's hopefully going to go ahead, um, if not next year. And hopefully you'll see you then. Um, I hope else? to be there. Obviously, we've got two more things to wrap up. I'm really keen to hear about that, but by all means, we can talk about that another time. Any other questions? Or by all means, I'll let you get to your Hello Fresh. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go make dinner right now. My, Hello, my girlfriend's fresh. waiting for me now. <laughs> <laughs> so no, that's it. I mean, I hope. Uh, thank you, Simon, so much for uh, having me on. Um, to Alex Smith, who's also talking there. Thank you. Oh, Alex. Ro oh, Alex. Roca Hi. <laughs> He's Roca a game Alvarez. Alvarez. Yesterday. We we're playing Great oh, cool, Western Trail cool. after midnight, so I, I can't. Oh, so, excellent. So excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I, I just hope that everybody out there who does end up seeing this will um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Again, I don't monetize myself. I just try to create content for people. Um, and I uh, hope you enjoy the stuff. You know, go like the Podfather of Gaming page on uh, on Facebook. We also have a group that we have chats in, the Podfather of the Gaming group. You can go there and become a member there. And we just put, post fun things and keep it light. You know, that's sort of what I want to do in, in the gaming world. I want my legacy to be Stephen Boniker as a fun fun person to talk to and hang out with. And uh, that's where I am. So, Alec, uh, Simon, thank you so much for this. It's been it's been great. Glad to, yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed your it just as much as myself now, knowing what other people, more fans, have got even more viewers. <laughs> okay, well, I'll have to go Excellent. and uh, digest that afterwards, I guess. But... <laughs> I'll leave you to it. I'll, I'll quickly have a wrap up with you once I've stopped the recording and we'll speak to you again very soon. So thanks very much. There'll be another video uh, daily whenever this goes out. There'll be another one straight away within 24 hours or so. But this might well go in the Indie Game Studio playlist. I, I don't know if Stephen's okay Ooh. with that. My mate, stick it there. Of course. More people of course. stick it there. And um, yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. And speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.